Hello and welcome back to episode 31 of the Boxing Social Podcast in association with Betfred, with me, your host, Rob Tebber. As always, before we get started, I'd just like to remind everybody to please like, comment and subscribe. Turn those notifications on for more boxing content. Now that's out of the way, I am delighted as always to be joined by two of the brightest minds in British boxing. Well, Andy, always good to have you back. Barry <laughs> broke in. Um, guys, there's only one place to start after a packed weekend of boxing and that's stateside. Terence Crawford defending his WBO welterweight title, becoming the first First man to stop Sean Porter out in Las Vegas. Barry, what did you make of the fight? I loved it. I really, yeah, I loved it. You know, the thing with Porter, you just, you know, he does what he says on the tin. You know, he gives 110% every time. He makes everyone work hard. And, you know, and he's always in a fight and he can always know. And unless you're, unless you're tip top, he'll beat you. And I think, and he, and he showed that against Saturday night against a, you know, a really good and focused Terence Crawford, I thought. But ultimately, Crawford just does everything really, really well, if not perfect, and that was the difference. Andy, we sat here uh, last week and went through uh, the fight before it happened, and we said, you know, Terence Crawford, this is the biggest step up of his career or the, the best opponent of his career so far. We had that measuring stick against your Kel Brooks, your Keith Furmans, your Errol Spencers. With that being said, what did you make of his performance on the weekend? I really enjoyed it. It seems to have been met with some mixed reviews in some quarters, but I felt like he was always in control of it. After five rounds, they had to kind of tell him, look, you know, Porter is winning rounds. Like they were a bit concerned about that, but but he obviously wasn't. I think it was one of those fights where he was aware that Porter might be winning some battles, but he was totally confident that, that Porter wasn't going to win the war. And that corner exchange towards the end of mm. the minute in between rounds between nine and 10 was, yeah. was unbelievable. I, I remember watching it and thinking, I would really love to know what was said there. So... I asked a question on Twitter and I got a lot of replies from people who had, who had figured it out and, and provided a transcript. And, and it was what I thought and kind of hoped yeah. it was, which was, he looked astonished, didn't he? And that was mm -hmm. them telling him, you could be behind here. And he just thought, that's, that's, that's absurd. All right, let's, let's deal with this then. And he went out and he, and he put him down within seconds. Mm. And that, that's, that's how good he is. That's how good he is. And... The stoppage, I thought, at the time, I thought was probably a bit quick. But when you look at it again, it's he knew what was coming, Kenny Porter. He knew what was coming. And it's just so impressive when somebody can just go out and do that mm. because they realise that that's what the situation demands. OK, fine, let's... Let's let's get this sorted out. Yeah, and it is going up to that that extra gear, that kind of elite level gear. Sean Porter was they were kind of back and forth and tip for tap relatively to that point. And he just stepped into that that upper level and Porter wasn't able to go with him. Similar to what we were saying this uh, last week ahead of the fight, where Crawford does have that that mean streak about him where it's like, okay, well, yeah, we're even and I'm gonna go out there and put him away. Um Barry, what did you make of the stoppage? As Andy's just mentioned there or on yeah, Twitter, social it's, media, there's a little bit of consternation, but well, if that was me, I'd be gutted. No, I say that by a man who's been stopped, of course, but I'd be devastated. But he wasn't. So you know, you see, if you're not, like he's an honest guy, uh, Port, and, mm. and you love him for that, you know, and so you know yourself deep down, all the excuses and the reason and all the false, ah, oh, you know sometimes when, when you're done. And he sort of knew, like when he was banging the floor, it was like it was frustration. I think he just knew, oh, like I can't win. I think it was more than like, oh, I didn't see the shot. I think it was a case of, oh, I just can't win. It's just not, what's going on? Like, it's not working for me. So when he got stopped then, I think, you know, the right was on the wall and his dad seen that in advance. That's a good thing. But I think uh, from a fighter's perspective, if you can get up and keep carrying on, you want to carry on. That's just the fight that in you. You don't have to be a face forward animal to be that way. Just it is. You know, it's happened to me, and I was no, I wanted to carry on. You're, you're disappointed. But, you know, and you can get up and so you can keep getting up, of course. So yeah, but when you when you look back now with a bit of hindsight, you can see that you know it was only going to go one way. But there, when I was watching it live, a bit like Andy, I thought, oh, you, they haven't given me every opportunity here. And you, you can you can also you can always say we always say, yeah, but the right was on the wall, like I've said already, and he, he would have got hammered. <laughs> but you know, it's <laughs> and I don't want to see anyone seriously hurt. But if every fight was stopped, you know, with with a with a worry what was going to happen in a minute's time. Then it wouldn't be the sport we love. That's the truth. Mm. And and you know, to honestly, you know, it is a brutal sport. It's, you have to we have to realize and, and and be honest about that. So, you know, I, I think he could have carried on. 
I think no, and and he might have got stopped. He might not. He probably would have, because Crawford's lethal and he's very accurate. And he, when you got the bit between his teeth, he's as mean as they, as as it comes. But you know, Porter's tough and strong and committed, so he might have seen it through. But yeah, and what his dad said after, of course, was interesting because that that gave it a a reason why he maybe thought he haven't got it. He's only gonna get. It's only gonna go one way now, and that's that's you no. Know, dramatically downhill but yeah I wasn't a fan of it but the fight itself was, was lovely to watch I think I gotta say what Porter, what Porter did one, a couple of times he showed I know I always say, we always say I always say and everyone always says you know, you've got to get your your front foot on the outside of the of a southpaw's front foot to get the advantage to throw the jab in the right hand Porter the way he was getting that foot on the outside when, when Crawford was as a southpaw didn't always work for him but it was just beautiful like he'd faint the jab take the step and then take a big, take a, he take, think the jab, and then take a big step to the left, and he'd be on a different angle. Then he'd fire forward with the jab. I was like, I was watching it, thinking, you know, he was getting beat, and Crawford was counteracting it quite well. I was thinking, this is brilliant. And then Crawford would spin him, and he would go with him. You know, Crawford would change stance and be really clever, and that's what he gets fighters. He gets on the other side of you, and then all of a sudden there'd be a massive pivot. I know I like to say pivot. It's because in my contract. It's minutes. in my contract, isn't it? <laughs> but the, and then all of a sudden he go whoop, he'd be wrong, and he'd be right in front of him. So Crawford would go, "Well, that's not working." He may, really made Crawford think. But I also think that Craw. I got to say about <coughs> something about Crawford. He, I've never known. I can't think of a fighter who's used his reach so consistently well as Crawford does. He never shortens a punch. He never shortens a punch. Every punch is long. You got you got crazy long arms for his size, and every punch is long. The uppercuts are long. That's where he bowls them in. You know the the hooks he get it comes down with him because he keeps that length. Everything's long with him, and and because he puts that front foot in, in in on you, and then leans a little bit back, you know, on the back foot. So he gets he always got the length. I've never known a fight I like it. He never shortens the distance. Never gives you a chance to, and that's why he's had to hit back because he you know he's throwing from a longer. You think he's there, but he's not. He, he honest God, I think he's so clever, naturally clever. Didn't deserve the credit then because it's just a natural. It's a natural <laughs> gift. Actually, thinking about it, but he is. He is. I think he's. I. I, I think he's a joy to watch. And when he, when he's forced to fight, because what he did to Porter there, he slowed Porter down. He didn't do loads of stuff, and the wrongs were close. But Porter likes to f put his foot on the pedal and go for it, and he never allowed Porter to to gain any momentum even when he's having success. And I think that tires a fighter out more than it does if you're throwing a million punches around because that's your rhythm. So he, he slows you down, takes you out your rhythm. Like we've said it all the time, but dictating the pace, making someone work harder than they used to work in, or slowing a fighter who works hard down, and it drains you. I always go back to tell people the analogy when you go running with somebody. Like I used to go running with, with, with my, with my trainers to follow me in the car, and I used to run when I was when I was boxing. And then even again, yeah, my ex missus was a dancer. She'd come with us, like she jumped in the car and jumped out for like a half a mile and come with me. That half a mile she did was the hardest because I had to slow down and run with her. So it just messes you up your rhythm, your breathing, and everything. It just it just drains you. And anyone who run, who's run with anyone else will find that it's not always the guy who's fastest. It's the one who sometimes you have got to run someone else's pace, whether it's fast or slow, drains you. And I think Porter, no, he allowed he didn't allow Porter to fight at his own pace. I think that's why he made Porter really hard. And but come then late the rounds end, even though Porter's super fit and always fit, I know I think that's no that's where you know, Crawford was allowed to go through more gears, and Porter couldn't wouldn't be able to stay with him. And they just want to go back to uh, something that Barry's alluded to there. Of course, we saw after the fight, Sean Porter called time on his his career, brilliant career that he's had. Um, the post-fight interview with Kenny Porter, of course, they have a very, I think, father-son relationships in, in boxing when it comes to certainly fighter and trainer. Always, they always have their interesting moments and Kenny Porter and Sean Porter are no different over the years. But a lot of people, myself included at the time, felt that his um, his post-fight interview may have been a little bit too honest or, or you know, maybe a bit too kind of forceful in the, in the heat of the moment. What did you make of it and the things that were kind of said in the immediate aftermath of the fight? My first reaction was that he didn't really need to go there in terms of, of what he said. And I, I don't think it was at all the case of him wanting to attract attention to himself or wanting any kind of limelight. I don't yeah. think he's ever really been about that, certainly not at, at this stage of proceedings. But I just thought he probably didn't quite need to say it. But then... When Sean subsequently retired during the during the press conference or announced his retirement during the press conference, I did think to myself, well, it made a little bit more sense then because obviously 
if he had been cutting a few corners, even if ever so slightly in the build up to that fight, and that's what his dad was talking about, then that really is a sign that it's time to go, isn't mm. it? That that's a sign that it's time to go because if for a fight like that you're not quite doing what you should be doing, then that's a, a signal to you that that it's probably time to call it a day. So those two things, it made more sense what he said in light of the subsequent retirement. But having said that, I still thought maybe he didn't really need to say it in the ring. In, in terms of father-son relationships, I'm a trainer and, and fighter. I'm not a fan. Um, I, I never have been. I know there have been some really, really successful ones, but... I just think you are too close with it. You can leave someone in too long because you so desperately want the win for them. Some dads have got big egos and they want the win for themselves. Or you you save them too quickly because you're you're overprotective. Um, the British Boxing Board of Control actually used to have a rule. Um, and I say used to, it's a long time ago. It was kind of, I think it changed in about 1960 that banned blood relatives from the corner. Wow. Um, I only know that because in Billy Walker's career, the, the the famous old old heavyweight, big big crowd puller in the sixties, his his brother George managed and basically trained him. And, and for the first portion of his, of his career, he couldn't go in the corner because of that because of that rule. And it was one of those many things that the WBC said a few years ago, three or four years ago, maybe that they were going to look at, um, and then of course never did. Mm. But um, yeah. I mean, they've been a great double act, though, haven't they? It, mm. It's it's definitely yeah, worked yeah. between those two. The respect is 100% there. And like Barry said, when he stopped the fight, there was no real dissent from his son. There was a little bit of disappointment. And I think that's down to two things. One, because he he did probably didn't really want to keep going, like you said. A fighter reaction is, speaks volumes a lot of the time. And also because he's just got a lot of respect for his old man and just thinks, well, yeah, you probably made the right decision. Yeah, they have a very close relationship. There's that the famous story of Kenny Porter's unfortunately passed away his brother when they were young. I think the story was told again before the weekend where he kind of crossed the road with his young brother when he was a kid and his brother unfortunately got hit by a car and was killed. So he is kind of like his sons are all his brother. They're very, very close. Obviously father sons in, in general are, but they're even more so together. Um what do you two think about the whole father son thing in the corner by my, the way? Well my dad was in my corner. I know, I know that's why I, 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 I mean, but he never would be my main trainer. That was his choice. I wanted him to be my main I, I, I especially when I, I gave up for a little while and came back and and um so I had like twelve months away working and um but and then I come back and said I want you to train me. I ended up going with Ronnie Rush because he had the gym in Ely. And it used to be Steve Robinson's trainer, and uh, but I wanted my dad to train me because he, in my, my mind, he taught me more than anyone else. You know, he, and he had, you know, because he, you know, he was a guy who would watch people and listen to people and listen to trains and watch fighters and stuff. And you know, me winning a silver in the Europeans was down to my dad, solely down to my dad. I mean, I had to fight, of course, so it's all down to me, obviously. But <laughs> no, but I mean, the, I hope to fight it. Hope to, hope to, the computer score was quite new, and he understood certain things. But he said, "This I don't know what I. There's things I don't know." And I don't want to be in a situation where I don't know stuff and you need to know it and I can't give it to you. So he would always be in the corner, but he would never be the main guy. And so it sort of worked for us. But I love it for that because there's no ego there. Like, you know, like as much because, you know, he's not getting, he's just getting the credit of watching his son do stuff, not getting the pats on the back mm. as a trainer will. Yeah. There's no accolations of any yeah. press or anything like that, you know. He yeah. just gets the knowledge that my, I'm helping my son do something. And this, this, I've said it before, like, like, and he'll feel the same. Sean will feel the same for his dad. How much his dad gets financially, you know, the sacrifices that your father, your parents will make for you to succeed. And we all get this in anything in life, but I only know it through sport. And and it's a debt I can't repay. Uh, it's just you can't repay it. You just can't. Like, the, you know, the, you know, the, the week's off work, so I go and box in tournament, he'd come with me. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the overtime he'd do so I could go and box in... You no, know, in in Norway and things like that, you know, like you don't see it at the time because it's just it's your dad, isn't it? What's he supposed mm. to do? You look back and you think, wow, all the selling tickets for me, you know, when I mm. first turned pro at eighteen, you know, and and like it's just like, how can I repay that? No, I'm not gonna pay him. He's not getting a penny off me, dad. By the way, not a penny. <laughs> but you know, and, and you never will. You never would, and you're never gonna. But you know, I love you for that, and and that's what it is with the son. So I think it's it's a it's a funny thing with fathers and sons. It it really is, but. Because how do you detach that? You have to be, there has to be an empathy there, but it has to be, you have to, have to try a, and separate. Yeah, something. an emotional attachment. Yeah, yeah. It has to be, it has to be. And you argue more with your dad in mm. the gym. Like, I'm not a very argumentative person, as you know. And 
<laughs> but we would argue all my time with my dad. I would never argue with Ronnie Rush or Pat Thomas was my first trainer. Never argue with Pat. And me and Pat would never see eye to eye on loads of things, like my first pro trainer. But I would just keep my mouth shut and go home and moan. But like my dad, we would have problem with Rose in the gym. And so with Joe, with Joe Kazagi with his dad. I think that can be quite healthy sometimes, though, because I do think the idea that it's a kind of master-pupil arrangement with trainer and fighter and, and there's never a crossword spoken... I'm not sure about that. That doesn't strike me as being particularly natural. Josh Warrington says the same with him and his dad. And and like I say, there have been some spectacularly successful combinations that they argue a lot. Um, I, I, and that sometimes other people in the gym will just say to them, you two need to sort this out now because, you know, there's an atmosphere in here and it's not helping. Yeah, mm. I would say one thing, though. I think, I think dialogue is brilliant, of course. You have to understand each other. But I do believe... That the train is the boss. Yeah, I, I totally agree he, with he that. He works but, for you. I understand. But, but it that. doesn't mean that you can't, you know, have you've a got, course, you've got to change every now. But yeah. you got like it clears the air, doesn't it? Sometimes you have to do what you're told in the gym. That's I think you have to. You don't always have to, but I think ultimately, to, to get that mental toughness more than anything else, you you have to be told what to do. If you know exactly what's going to happen every training session, and I think that happens a lot nowadays in modern fighters. I'm going totally off topic, and I love it, but I think that. I think mentally softens you. Like you're not as mentally tough. And like you might have that mental toughness, but you don't know. But I think that was being told, like go down the gym, being told to do something. Like no, you go down, you've got to put an itinerary of what you're going to do every day of the week, which is great. But you know, you can mentally prepare yourself. I used to go down the gym and not know what I was doing. I mean, literally, go down the gym and go go for a run. What? You're not about to go for a run. And that was as an amateur, definitely. You know, it was like that. You just didn't know what you were going to do. So literally, I go down the gym as an amateur, and they go. Go home, you're boxing tonight. It would be that. I swear, and I would, that, that happened like about well, 30 times in my career as an amateur. And by the way, I actually thought if he can use, a, if he can use his works van and take us. And that was, that's, all, that's why I boxed. I like that keeps you on your toes, doesn't it? I remember going to see Jim McDonnell once. And I know Jim's got the reputation as being a legendary kind of taskmaster when it comes yeah. to fitness. And he is. But I was down there to see Reese Bellotti and they were going through the session. And, and I said, okay, so, well, beforehand, I said to Reese, so what are you doing today? And he says, well, I've got a rough idea. But I don't really know, and I don't know how long it'll be. Jim never mm -hmm. tells you when it's going to be over. I so they, they were doing a load of groundwork, and you don't know when it's going to finish. And he just demands that you're giving it your maximum all the way through, but you don't know when it's going to finish. I, I, I found that quite interesting. <laughs> no, it's probably not great for your body. I think everyone trains now to get the maximum out of your body, and I, I understand that totally. And some people are just mentally tough and don't need it. But you don't know until you're in a fight. Like, say, like Josh Taylor, he knows he's mentally tough in a fight that he can dig it out and tough it out. So it doesn't matter. So even though it's okay, he should sometimes have that in the gym where he don't know what you're doing, they can have a proper training schedule for him and structure because they know that when no, when he's back against the wall, it's he there. has it, yeah. But you don't know until you fought, so you're, in that situation, you're in round nine, you're blowing out your backside, that you've got that fight in you, in a tough fight where the guy just keeps coming at you, that you've got that fight to... Dig in there for the next, you know, the next four rounds, and because it's it's you no, know, it's hard until you've been that situation. You don't know, and you want to quit. I don't care who you are. You but equally, quit. if you can do that, then I think often the technical side of the training becomes more important because you don't want your fighter to rely on that. You don't want them to think, well, I'll just drag him into the trenches because I know I can do that. No, but it's not, it's not so much drag him into the trenches. It's, it's it's so you don't give up. Yeah, no, I know no, what you're saying. It's but... fight or fight, and you just don't know how you're going to react. And it's so like, so when you, oh, what I say about running in the mornings, like it's for your body, it's not the best. Uh, but mentally, to get up at five o'clock in the rain and the wind and it's freezing and you're cold and you're tired and your missus is next to you, especially when you're 20, you know, and, and she's, she's 20, not like, no, <laughs> you know. Careful, <laughs> Barry. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, or, or, or man, you know, you've got women boxing or, or, or gay, whatever you are, you put your partners next to you, it, it, you, you want to snuggle in there, you don't go back, you don't get up and go running. That's the worst thing in the world to do. But you get up and you do it and you have to do it and you're forced to do it. Or, you, or I had I had an, an old an old like five foot four tr Trinidadian beeping beep me on outside my house. So if I didn't get up, everyone on the whole street wanted to fill me in. So you know, I, so that would happen. You get up, and you run, and and it didn't. And physically, it was awful for you, but it, but mentally, I knew if I didn't when I didn't want to do something, it was in me to do it. And and that's and that's massively important. I knew when it, when I when I when my worst moment, and I just want to just pack and give up. Which I had in a fight. I've had in a fight. I've been down six times in one fight, for God's sake. So, you know, I got up six times. So that, that I think you don't know how you're going to react anyway. But I think the training helped. All my career, I'm to do things I didn't want to do. 
I go down to the gym and I think I'll be sparring, but I'm not sparring. You're doing circus for an hour. Or you or you go down to the circus and you are sparring. And all of a sudden, oh, you don't know you don't know what you're doing until you go down there. It's just everything's just, what am I doing today? Easy session today. Oh, thanks. And you get the impression, to bring this back to what we were talking about, that Terence Crawford and Sean Paul there we go. have, done all, of the things, have <laughs> done all of the things that they don't, that nobody wants to do in the gym. Yeah. Terence Crawford, right, is Terence Crawford, he fights like a kid who has nothing. I don't mean he just goes all out of aggression. He has that rawness about him still, that he doesn't have a penny to his name, and nothing matters. Do you know what I mean? That's what he looks like. Mm. He has that, like... He looks like to me, Terence Crawford, that if I, even me, an old man, little old man, if I walk past him now and I give him a dirty look, he wouldn't think, I'm Terence Crawford. He go, oh, that's just a little old man. He go, who are you looking at? Mm. He couldn't, you could see it in him. He has that, he has that street hasn't left him. Oh, like how cold was he in the press conference with Bob Arum? I mean, that was <laughs> savage. Absolutely <laughs> savage. Yeah. Like, as savage as anything you saw him doing, as ice cold. And as savage as anything you saw him do in the ring that night. Little Bob's face just sat there on the stage, just yeah. wistfully watching Terence Crawford. Well, we don't know where he's going to go, but yeah, no, I agree. Very cold indeed. Right, back on to the fight. Now we've got the image of a 20-year-old Barry getting out of bed first thing in the morning out of our minds. Um, Andy, we sat here, we discussed it. Um, I guess the question remains now, is Terence Crawford the best welterweight in the world? I think it, I think I would say he is now. Um, last week, I... Uh, what I said was that he needed to, if he turned in a real big performance and, and won by stoppage and, and beat him more significantly or, or better, if you like, than Spence did, then I would put him at number one. And I think he did that. People will argue, they always do, that maybe Porter's not quite the same as when he fought Spence because it is nearly two years ago. Well, it is two years ago. And you can say that if you like, but, but ultimately Porter seemed to me to bring exactly what he brought against Spence. And Crawford handled it more comprehensively. So yeah, I would I would say he is. And, and I'm I'm kind of pleased to be able to say it, not because I care, but just because we've been waiting for for this. Yeah. I think from Crawford, that's what we were talking about last week, and we were saying that that Porter, if he's what everybody has always said he is, Crawford, Porter would force it out of him, um, or give him the opportunity to show it rather than force it out of him, and and that's what happened. Barry? Yeah, I do. I always thought that he was bet in the pound for pound list, which I hate, but I thought he was higher up there as, as a pound for pound fighter, but still, you had to pay Spence the best welterweight because his, his resume that has been in the welterweight division is far better than Crawford's, but Crawford's overall is, is better in general. But yeah, I think after, just to say what Andy said, pretty much, I can't argue with exactly the same. He just he did a better job. And he's more active and he's spent the same fight. You know, it's all those things going into play. He just does so many more things. I just thought, I thought Spence was more regimented and more direct, which I think causes Crawford more problems, actually, because he punches right down the line. But Crawford was more athletic, much more athletic than him. And so that's what made the fight intriguing. Now I think, you know, he's, such, he's so patient, Crawford. He's such a good thinker. You can see him. He never like the first two rounds in every fight. Actually, unless he unless he catches you, and then then he'll go for it. He, he so many similarities. He boxes nothing like him. Looks nothing like him. He's in a different weight. So many similarities to Uzik. He has the way that he don't nothing. Just don't panic. Rushes it. Doesn't panic. Looks like the other guy's being in the fight all the time. But he's working you out. He's just thinking, what well, what can I do? Let's have a look. Well, let's see what how, how things. How I react. How he reacts. How I react to his power. How I react to his moves. And he and he just and then he then he just implements more of his physicality or his style or his strengths or whatever. And he puts more on you every time, every every round, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then you have a fight back, which always happens. But then he maintains mm. that pace or that that presence or whatever he's doing at the time, the movement, the speed, whatever, whichever things that he's working on, he maintains that and just keeps edging forward, edging forward and smothering you with whatever he got, ability, strength, power. With different fights, different moves he has to do. And I think he can box so many different ways that <laughs> how would you train for a guy who can do pretty much everything? Yeah, it was sort of one of the things that was alluded to in the commentary. It was sort of like you have to prepare for a southpaw, you have to prepare for somebody who's going to come at you, you have to prepare for a counterpuncher. You kind of almost have to prepare for three different fighters to face one guy. And again, going back to because he never shortens the shots, because everything's long. You have, I'll go back and I'll watch it. Oh, every, even when he throws up the cuts, they're, they're long. It's hard because you had the fire back because you feel like he's far away from you. 
that's the thing. You feel like he's, he has such long arms and he uses them as good as any fight they've ever seen. So it's hard to to get in a firefight with him unless you're big and tall yourself. But uh, apart from that, and then he, then he uses his feet. It's hard. No, you just think someone like some, someone who's technically brilliant. You got to make them rush their work. That's most of the time. You make them rush their work. You put loads of pressure on them and just smother them with pressure. But he ties a fighter up like he fuck, like he's a boxer from the fifties. Like he this goes in straight away. As soon as you're close to him, he goes in. He puts his arms in like this. He's like an octopus. His arms go inside you. He comes out. He gets your arms on the outside. So you can punch. And he's in, and he's in like that. And he, and he gets the inside ground. And he's in on you. And he, and he gets you like this. If he doesn't spin you, instead, how many times you be behind Porter in that fight? He spins him. Gets his head underneath the underneath the armpit. Goes right under. Loops around and he's behind you. And if he doesn't do that, he gets his arms inside and he tucks you up. He ties you up without holding. So you can warn him. He's going. I'm not holding. We're just tangled up. But he's done that, and he does it. So if he's not working, and then if he doesn't do that, he whip, he's whipping up a cut and hitting your head back every ten seconds. <laughs> it's 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 difficult. You know, so you can't you commit yourself. You know he's going to tie you up or hurt you. If you don't commit yourself, he's going to outbox you. Yeah, he's a, he's a truly elite level fighter, isn't he? And then and it's a word that's bandied around a bit too readily. I find there's a handful of them, and 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 he's one of them. I mean, yeah. he absolutely is one of them. Usyk's another one you mentioned there. Fury, you would say, would be would be another one. But there's not; they're not coming out of you know they're not coming out of every orifice, are they? Mm. Real elite level yeah. fighters. For me, I think there's just to touch in on a way. Said, like the, yeah, the, about the pound for pound list. I think there's kind of like an established four, really: Canelo, Usyk, Canelo, of Inoue, Crawford. There's your four. However, you kind of slice it and dice it. I mean, not that there's any kind of way of, of deciphering a pound for pound list anyway, but Fury obviously being yeah. a heavyweight and like the significant size advantages he's got, while obviously an elite heavyweight in this fictitious, nonsensical pound for pound <laughs> list, it's difficult to yeah. kind of slot with, him with in. With Fury, it's just it's just the fact that he's shown us that he can do it any which yeah. way. Yeah. That's what you were talking yeah. about there, really. Yeah. So next for Terence Crawford, we mentioned there the the, the kind of the. Dropping a bombshell in the post-fight interview, poor old Bob Arum sat there and um, it really gave, <laughs> it really gave no fucks, uh, as it were. <laughs> um, what next? With PBC? Is he going to go over to PBC? Going to run through that welterweight stable? It's what we've wanted to see for years and I years now. It seems I like hope, it's there. I hope so. Do you? No. I, yeah, absolutely. It, except for if he goes for the ESPN, we get to watch it on Sky. That's the only good thing because they got to deal with the with, with top ranks. So we get to watch it. If it goes on PBC, we got to pay extra for it. Well, they could buy other fights, Sky. They they had Pacquiao. Yeah, yeah. they had Pacquiao. The zone could buy. I asked Joe Markovsky this when they announced and, and sort of said that you know would you be interested in taking a PBC show for example and showing it in some of your territories and Joe said you know we wouldn't rule anything out so you would hope that somebody uh, I mean you'd think for some for a, as big a fight as that they'd be able to find a broadcaster or something. Are you know. friendly with this, Joe? Are you? Ask him if he needs anyone of any work. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> please, get, please hire Barry Jones. I can't even get work on your shows. But Terence Crawford, <laughs> Terence Crawford could do. He doesn't need to really commit to any one place, does he? He can. No. He could follow the Canelo. The is Canelo's he a big enough? Is he a big not. enough sell seller to do that? Though? He, he's that, not. That's kind of. He's not. He's not a big enough. He's not a big enough name. Oh, but at sorry. the moment, I don't think anybody wants to be signing any long-term deals with anyone, do they? I mean, it's there's so much going on. It's. But the, the, are you going to be willing to to let him run through your welterweights if you're Al Heyman? Just like I know Canelo did kind of a one-off fight for Caleb Plant, but you know they don't have the same commercial appeal as the welterweights. True, that's true. Yeah. So that's Canelo true. going over there and boxing on Showtime. But the fight's really uh, it's it's Spence, and we're waiting. He's got to have retinal surgery, hasn't he? That could mm. that could take a long time. I mean, he might, you know, that that can be really. Bad news. I think the latest with Spencer is that he's back in the gym and they're looking to get him a fight sorted. I think so. I think he has got a mandatory, isn't it? Yeah. He? Yeah. The, the WBA again are fucking things up. They're doing like um mm -hmm. I think they're doing like another tournament now and then he's right. not you know he's got a boxer. I think that makes sense. So to, 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 let's do a tournament to find the real world champion for one organization. When you should only have one anyway. Yeah, but then <laughs> they're doing a tournament to find a regular champion to fight a super champion. It's just all what? nonsense. Yeah, so it's like Rasputin and, and the, the other guys. I can't remember who. Jamal, not Jamal James, just got beat. Um, those guys. I think they're, they're doing so. I don't know. It's easy to kind of ignore it when I see it coming up because obviously Ugas is the WBA champion. But, but either way, he gets the PBC. I didn't PBC because that makes, him, that makes the fight with Spence showtime, makes it easier 
to make. The, You'd surely think that, that he's going to go. If he's now left top rank, surely he's got an eye on. Or, well, it can be the only thing because the uh, the other really good fight for him is Josh Taylor, but he's with top rank. Yeah. So, and he said after the fight as well, Crawford, that he doesn't see himself boxing Josh Taylor anytime soon. Exactly. So that would kind of insinuate that he's not going to be hanging his hat back at, it's at spent, top rank, isn't it? It's it's it's. Well, that was one of the main reasons that he pissed in on Bob's cornflakes but said, said to him like he couldn't get me the Spence fight when I was with him so how's he going to get me it now I've left him yeah so you would think that that's the one that he wants and if not if not Spence and he moves up to 154 which he's spoken about in the past and I could see him doing that I could see him going up to 154 and boxing a Jamel Charlo I yeah. think the WBO are going to allow or Tim Sue's going to step aside to allow that rematch between Charlo and Castaño so if he fights the winner of that, that's another feasible opponent for him. But of course, that's also PBC. Yeah. So if you're going to go and box Jamal Charlo, you're going to have to go and... Well, there you go. And it's not it's nearly as big as in boxing sports, no, is it? No, no, no. And, and the, the big pot of money that's on, on the table for the Spence fight would surely drive people to... Or drive Crawford to 147 and make Al Heyman want to you know, bring him into that 147 mix. You've got Garcia's moving up to 154. Um, but you've still got Keith Furman there. Still got obviously Errol Spence. I mean, Jaron Ennis is kind of the. I don't see him getting uh, getting a shot at Crawford or Spence before they fought each other or before they decide that to kind of park that to one side, as it were. So, you would think it's got to be PBC. Yeah, and and that's it's the only fight in it. Certainly, it's more for Spence, I think, than there. And also, they're not young, mm. by the way. You never cut old old Crawford now, thirty three. Things thirty three, yeah. You no, know I mean, like you know, you wait a couple mm. of years now. He's mid thirties. He's no, he's not far off forty all of a sudden. And you, you're edging away. And you know, how long can he keep keep going for? And 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 how long is your interest going to keep upon him? You know, that's the only fight for me. For it them. is. It, if if they can, if they don't is. fight each other next, if it's not no, even Spence, even the eye injury and all that, no, you've got to fight. You got to fight Crawford next. Because the, the edge has gone off the other fighters in that division, haven't they? Like yeah. Thurman, after the layoff and then losing to Pacquiao, he's not as big a name or as attractive as he as he used to be. Danny Garcia, you could say the same about. Yeah. Sean Porter's fight. now gone. Pacquiao's now gone. It's just Spence. I mean, it really Ennis is, is a, just Ennis Spence. Is brilliant, but unproven. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, no. And just to, for, for risk reward, why yeah, are you going to yeah, do he, that? He and he's again, company. he's not a PBC fighter. He boxes on Showtime, but not a PBC fighter. You've got Virgil Ortiz, who's making his way up um, in the WBO rankings. Of course, the WBC just called for him versus David Avenisian, which doesn't look like he's going to happen. Uh, yeah. Rick Marigian, who is manager of, of Virgil Ortiz, basically came out and said, "Yeah, great, they ordered it, but as we all know, it doesn't mean anything having a, a governing body or a British Boxing Board of Control." So doesn't certainly doesn't guarantee the fight. So, yeah, you would think that it's kind of, well, why are you going to fight him like a Thurman or, I don't know, Crawford Brona? It's a difficult one to even imagine coming coming together. Why would you have that's that fight? That's the fight, actually. That's the fight. Enough. That's the, that's the fight. To Enough. Up, isn't it? Um, if Brona lets his hands go, no. Um, <laughs> but, and, then, and then the um, and then the kind of the flip side of that coin is, okay, why are you going to box a Virgil Ortiz or a Jaron Ennis when they're, I mean, obviously great for us for fighters, but trying to kind of understand and see the logic behind it and from the a business point of view. And the money he'll want, no. Yeah. The money he'll demand, no. Because no, they'll say, I'll come with you, but what are you going to give me? And they're going to have to offer him a lot of money. Mm. No. I mean, that's that's the thing as well, we're, we're kind of touching on the, the Canelo situation. It's difficult for Crawford to command the same market, or he's not going to command the same market value, but to be able to dictate to the promoters yeah. without bringing in half a million, 750, a million pay-per-view that's buys. That's true. It's going to be difficult for him to kind of take his hat and see who's going to put the most money in it. Well, they can say, listen, we'll give you, they can say to Crawford and Spence, you can have forty five percent each of the of the pay per view, and we'll just take our ten percent after. No, we'll just take what we'll, after expenses. We get to a certain figure. We'll take five percent, and you take the rest. But you don't know what's going. They're not going to. They're going to go. Where's that guarantee? Yeah. Of course, obviously. No, no. With Canelo, you can go. I want fifteen million guarantee because they know they're going to make at least that. No, <laughs> if they don't make that, then yeah. Canelo's obviously come out and said, I'm actually... He's a bit like Andre I'm, Ward, I'm actually, Terrence. I'm yeah, actually, Scott, yeah it's sense. a good comparison. Like Andre yeah. Ward, brilliant, brilliant fighter. But those two fights against Kovlev didn't really sell that well from yeah. the figures mm -hmm. we were given. And and Crawford, again, like you say, is is a spectacular fighter. But, but my original statement that he could follow the Canelo model is actually he can't. You know, and you've just pointed out exactly why he can't really. But you, you do think that 
you look at how ice cold he was with Aram and how focused he is on on everything. This, you'd imagine, is an example of a fighter just looking to take control of the situation and say to his team, this is what must happen. I have to fight Errol Spence. Get it done. I'm going to leave top rank. That's kind of my part done. Now do your job. You'd think, wouldn't you? Yeah, it's going to be difficult, though, because you've got Errol Spence, who is a pay-per-view attraction in America, who does sell in America, and he's coming from a, a, a point of view of being a unified champion at the weight. Obviously, the bigger commercial draw. We've seen in the past, and we all hate to talk about splits and mm. sides of the street and stuff like that, but the fat remains. It's, it, it, exactly. It's, it's, it's as an important part of boxing as the jab nowadays. Like, we're talking about this sort of stuff. So... You would hope that there's room to get that deal done now between them. I can't see it being next for Spence. Coming off the back of a serious eye injury like that, you'd think at least he'd go back in there with somebody. But look what happened the last time. Look, look, you know, he, had, he has that horrific chaff car accident, comes back and he gets an eye injury. Hmm. Why? I, I, to me, I think, you know, like, like get the Crawford fight. It's the biggest financial fight that you out there for him is Crawford, surely, for him as well. I would imagine. It's the biggest financial fight, but the, the the kind of flip side of the coin is it's also the fight of the era as a welterweight. If you're going into but that fight, is, you want to make sure that you you're well. Think, if, for him, just financially, now you're just thinking, like, what happened with with a car accident? You 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 you, 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 you risked yourself yeah, there. Yeah. That, that was that. You, know, you, you touch base there a little bit. Then you then you go on about the, the eye injury. Then after the after the last scrap. Who knows? You could fight someone else who's rubbish this time, and then something else could happen. Like, why do you want to tempt fate? Take the fight. I I knew this like just take your wallet there. You don't know you don't know what's going to happen next week. You fail a brain scan. That happened to me. Mm. Anything can happen. You just take the fight. If it's there offered for you and it's good money to be made, better money than anywhere else, and it's a career defining fight. It's a it's an era defining fight. Mm. No, I I hate the word legacy. Cause everyone's got a legacy now, and that's absolute bollocks, right? It really is because I haven't got a legacy. No, we all, we, no, you where's your legacy? It's rubbish. I just say with, with legacy. But this is but this is legacy. It, it is, but when, when fighters are obsessed with legacy, but but legacy is what other people think about you, mm. and you can you can influence that, but, but ultimately you can't decide and it, yeah. construct no, this, it and this plan is, it. You just do what you do. Because this fight will you remember if you're a boxing fan, like all these fighters going about their legacy. Most fighters who mentioned the word legacy, you forget you forget who they are in five years time anyway. It's irrelevant. But like, so it's yeah, it's what you say, and it's, it's correct. But this fight is a legacy fight because if you're yeah, wrong this has with the you remember to remember them two fought no this is like this is it's not the Tommy Hearns the um, Leonard fight but it's no it's one of the closest things we've it's had it's this era's version of it it's this it obviously yeah. I know they're, 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 ten, they're 15 years after the, the two best welterweights after. of a decade clearly yeah like, so by it, the way. obviously not the same commercial appeal as Mayweather Pacquiao not as high level of fight as, as Leonard versus Hearns both undefeated you, yeah you know, but it has so, so many yeah there are yeah. so there are so many um, bits that you can sell the fight on because I've got to say about, about Leonard and, and Crawford I remember the, um, um, Bob Arum said that very early in his career He's our, he's, he's our, he's this year a Sugar Ray Leonard. I thought that was he on about. Don't bother, he boxes nothing like him. He's not as charismatic, or good looking, all those things. He's not. But he is. The one thing he has in common with Leonard is, very rarely do you get a beautiful boxer. He's a killer. Yes. Yeah. Who's a killer? And I don't like to say the word killer with when boxing involved, but yeah, like, I know what you mean. But he, he you know, you're right. He, he is. He's a killer. Like he has. Because Leonard was the, Leonard Benitez was another one by the way. Was beautiful to box. Beautiful, lovely, beautiful boxers. Nasty, horrible. Give you an opportunity, and they will cut you to pieces. Like you know, you, you just see him. Like, they were nasty, horrible men in the ring. Like Len, some of Leonard's finishes are, are horrific. Like he's smiling, he's all cute and mm. lovely, you know. Like you take him home to your, you know, you take him home to see your mother. Like, look, look who I'm with. Like you know, you'd be happy if your daughter came home with him. He's just a lovely guy. In the ring, you'd be like, like you have nightmares over him. And he's beautiful to watch, and he's a great style. And he's flurry all those flurries. But early in his career, he was like just some of the knockouts were horrendous. And I think Crawford's that that in, in, in the same milk. He's beautiful, skillful, thoughtful in his work. But once he has a sniff of blood. That's that's your ass. You're done. Okay. Well, before we move on, obviously, lots to talk about this past weekend, and of course, coming up this weekend. Final word on Terence Crawford: Does he beat Errol Spence if the fight happens next? I think he does. I think he does. I've previously I might have favoured Spence because I'd seen more of him in 
in the trenches, if you like, because of that fight against Porter. But having seen Crawford against against Porter, I just think that overall Crawford's better. Barry, uncharacteristically for me, yes. That's it, yeah. There we go. We don't usually get many one-word answers from Barry Jones, but we are on a time limit today, so I am uh, I'm pretty grateful for that. Um, Terence Crawford versus Errol, Sp- uh, Terence Crawford versus Errol Spence. Getting ahead of myself there. Terence Crawford versus Sean Porter was, of course, one of the offerings from stateside this past weekend. The other, Demetrius Andrade against Jay Quigley. Again, Andy, we sat here last week and we thought it was going to be a tall order for Jay Quigley, and that's pretty much what we saw on Saturday night, uh, Friday night. It, yeah, it was in the end. I, I was. I was hopeful he would get through to the second half, Jason, and um, I predicted a 10th round stoppage, I think, but he just couldn't get out of the the early stages. Andre set about him and it didn't last very long. I, I felt for Quigley because he's a lovely guy and he's a good fighter and this is the opportunity that he'd been waiting for. He probably won't get another one. Mm. I think that's pretty much an accurate statement and it'll be interesting to see what happens with Andre now because he is good he is a really good fighter and his network and his promoter will will claim that he's been much avoided and you can understand the argument behind that but the reality is that fighters aren't avoiding him because they think that he'll beat them just because more because he doesn't really bring a lot to the table commercially. That's that's the problem he's got, isn't it? And that's why they can't be tempted into a into a fight with him, unless he was uh, unless he was the final piece of the jigsaw that that say Caleb Plant was for Canelo at, at, at super middleweight. That's the problem he's got. That's the problem he's always had. Yeah, and it's kind of like a it's a multitude of things that kind of go together with that as well. If he was you know if he was a belt holder who was potentially a flat footed come forward, you know basic sort of style you can imagine somebody going okay well yeah it's not a massive combo, but I'll beat him easy but the fact that he's an awkward southpaw and I don't necessarily subscribe to the cause of him being you know a slickster and what have you I don't think he is very slick I think he's athletically very gifted yeah. um, but when you add those things together with the fact that he's also on the zone which when you look at the other uh, platforms in America of ESPN Showtime Fox etc it is n- not the same it's not comparable so it's difficult again what we always talk about crossing the street getting people to go and box on on a subscription service when they're boxing on cable TV in America is always going to be difficult anyway um, Barry your your kind of initial thoughts of, of this past weekend? Anything surprise you? No, I, not to be honest. And you know, again, it was it was quickly chance of a lifetime, and you know you take it. You know, but but you, nobody thought outside of the, the the Quigley camp that he really had much of a chance. To be honest, I, and but Andre starts fast. He usually, but usually you know he 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 gets complacent or he, or, he, or or lazy or whatever it is. He he, he doesn't want to again that I talked earlier about that that instinct to finish a fight. He hasn't really ha- he doesn't have that. But he had it Friday night a little bit more. But I think that's because he was boxing levels below himself. To be honest, that's no slight on Quigley. He's a, again, yeah, I think he's a he's a good fighter. But that was just a jump too high for him. Again, where does where does Andre go? That's the problem. No, he's tra- he's been trading water now for the last few fights. You know, boxing, you know, uh, uh, Liam Williams did tremendously well, but he was never really win- winning the fight. And to say again, I go back to what Andy says about him being massively avoided. If Liam Williams can hurt him, even for a second. What's Golovkin going to do to him? And again, no slight on Liam Williams, but they're not the same level, Golovkin and Liam Williams. Mm. So, you know, if Golovkin hits you, and, and if Liam Williams can hurt you, Golovkin can put you to sleep. That's just, that's just it. And he can, he's, more, he's better, accurate, and, and it's hard and everything about him. So, you know, they're not avoid. You say, oh, he's a nightmare for Golovkin because of his movement. But I go back to what you say. Like, he's not a slickster. He's at massively athletic. Mm. He's got long reach and he uses it quite well. And he sits on that back foot. He makes it awkward for you. But for someone like a Golovkin or someone like that, then you know he would just walk through you, to be honest. And also, I think with uh, Demetrius Andre, what we saw against Jason Quigley and also Liam Williams and in other fights, Luke Keeler, for example, he knocked him down, I think, in the first 10, 15 seconds. He kind of hits you, shows you that athleticism, yeah. puts you in a box, and then he can dictate. And obviously, he hasn't gone through the gears and kind of pushed on in later in fights because he hasn't really needed to. But 
you couldn't do that against a Gennady Golovkin. He'd never no. been dropped in 350 amateur fights, 30-odd fights as a pro. And you can't sit on your laurels with someone like yeah. Golovkin at the high level. He, Andre's a little bit like that. Like, ah, look what I can do. Mm. See what I did? Look what I can do. All right, that's four rounds ago now, mate. So he's really talented, but he had, but he just doesn't really, like, I I, can, I, wish I, I wish I didn't. He's better than I could ever be. But he says that about him, like, that he's just like, yeah, I can, look what I did. See what I did the other day? See what I did? Like, see what I did? Like in round two, because you're in round ten now, though, mate. You know, you just, and you just coasted. That's what he does. He he gets a big lead and then just coasts his mm. way through and things like this. Because he th he's making you miss, and he and to him it's great. Like when you're inspiring, you're making people miss, and you're doing like this with your head, you're bobbing and weaving. It looks, you think it looks great, but it doesn't look great to us at home. It looks like you're, you know, you're doing what you want to do, but do some more, no? Mm. Sometimes you can be over defensively, just make people miss and pick them apart. But it's not always crow pleasing. Mm. It's clever. And he is clever, and he is gifted, and he is a good fighter, and he is. And I don't say anyone beats him easy. I don't think. No. But yeah, but he, but he hasn't proved himself yet at that level. And he needs a test. Yeah, man. Him and Charlo, I think, would be probably the. That's the biggest fight in world boxing. Biggest fight. I can't think of a bigger fight in the last <laughs> like 40, 50 years. To be honest. It's <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting take. One of many interesting takes that uh, Chris Mannix has. Um, but yeah, I guess that's one of the the good things about this past weekend. You know, he hurt quickly in the first round, and it wasn't a case of you know he did go about, he did go and push for the stoppage. I think it, uh, Quigley said after the fight he broke his jaw in the first round. And then in the second round, it almost looked like every time he touched him, it, there was the first knockdown in the, the second knockdown in the second round, which wasn't scored. And then he knocked him down, I think, two or three more times after that. But yes, moving on to the biggest fight in world boxing, according to Chris Mannix. Demetrius Andrade versus Jamal Charlo, that do anything for you, Andy? Yeah, I'd like to watch it. I'd like to watch it. I don't really see it happening, though, because as we've said, the the usual problems of, of different networks, different promoters, and, and Andrade... And that kind of scenario, Andrade's already high enough risk, relatively low reward. And then when you factor in the complications that, that come with making that kind of fight, I think he might be not condemned. I'm not sure that's exactly the right word, but I think he might just have to face up to the fact, Andre possibly, that, that he's just going to need to keep defending that belt. And... He'll make money and see what happens. Because I would like to see him fight Charlo, but I don't see it. I don't see it happening, mm. personally. Yeah, it could have happened. People seem to forget it could have happened a few years back at 154 pounds and Demetrius Andrade pulled out. So um, we could have seen it a few years ago, but obviously it's now built to a, a level that Chris Mannix deems is the biggest in, in world boxing. I'd like to see the fight. What about you, Barry? It's a good fight. It's a good, it's a good fight. But it's not when that you know that I that I think when I lay down and think oh I, where would I like to go and watch a fight next week mm. that's not that's not the first one that comes to my mind. There's ten more fights better than that, but there's three, four, four more fights better than that in the division alone. There's there's a better fight involving each one of those fighters than that fight. Do you know what I mean? Like like mm. I like. I'd rather see Golovkin in either one of those before I see them two together. Yeah, the biggest fight in the middleweight, the biggest fight in world boxing, or the biggest fight certainly in the middleweight division, has to have Gennady Golovkin in it, yeah. doesn't it? Like, also, by, it's the, by, by the far way, the biggest he, name. He's still with the zone, isn't he? Yeah, and this is another yeah. thing. You've got Jaime Munguia, who's the WBO mandatory. Oh, yeah, him, yeah. He's the, who fought last week. He's the WBO mandatory. You've got Gennady Golovkin on the platform still. Ryota Murata is not the zone fighter. Um, and then you've got various other guys kind of fleeting in and out. Derevianchenko is good to watch. Derevianchenko, yeah. Yeah. Times, yeah. Thing is, if you can't say his name, you can get interested in him. <laughs> that's the thing. Dead, but I, I don't dead, think dead, there's... Dead, 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 dead. That's why he can't get work. <laughs> There's but many other reasons, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, but yeah, I think if you look at uh, the middleweight division now, I think your feasible challengers or your feasible opponents, not necessarily challengers for Demetrius Andre, would be Jamal Charlo. Don't think that's going to happen. Jaime Munguia is the obvious one to me. That's the obvious one to me because also I feel like Jaime Munguia has been improving. I felt like he was good against Rosado. Um, admittedly, it is Rosado. We kind of know his limitations over the years, but yeah. still very good fighter and on the back yeah. of a very good win. So I feel like that's got to be the fight to make. Surely you want to be making the fights that you can make on your own platform before you start talking about cross... We all know these big cross-promotional fights, they happen for the biggest fights in the sport only. Yeah. 
They don't happen for the second, third, fourth, fifth division. They're hard you know, work. They're, they're hard, hard work. To exactly. They have to transcend the sport from the, to, to, to yeah. the fruition. I, I would say this: the zone, it's down to the zone. Forget about who promotes who. The zone. If you got this fighter here, they're they're, they're a streaming platform, boxing mainly based, especially in the UK, and you got you got Golovkin, you got Andre there, two good middleweights. You go. Why are you two fighting? Well, I'm with I'm with this guy. He's with this guy. I want you just go. I'm paying you. I'm paying you. Do you want to get paid? Do you want to get paid? Fight each other, or don't get paid. Yeah, I'm not sure what the relationship at the minute is like with Golovkin and Dazone. They had some. They had some issues not too long ago where Golovkin, I think, had. You know, when the where it was a similar situation with Canelo Alvarez yeah. when Canelo first got his Dazone deal, I think there was some some wording in the contract oh, which allowed cool. Canelo to pretty much do whatever he wanted. And I think Gennady Golovkin was of a similar ilk, which is why we've seen him against you know, Steve Rolls and um, Camille Saramito, who of course was a mandatory, but still. I don't necessarily see Gennady Golovkin, which is kind of a bit of an about face, I think, for him. He was so avoided throughout his career. I'm not really sure. Look, the Maratta fight's a good fight, but one that I think everybody's expecting yeah. Gennady Golovkin to not only win, but look very good in. I don't really see him kind of going, oh, yeah, I'll fight an Android because for the, all the reasons that we've already outlined. But somebody like Jaime Munguia, on the other hand, kind of coming up, he already did. become world champion. That's the fight yeah. for him, surely. Surely that's but the then, fight. But Andre's, think, uh, Andre's thinking the same as what Golovkin thinks about Andre. I, need, I don't need that fight. Yeah. I well, don't that, need... That's boxing, isn't it? <laughs> like you always no, get people it's, it's like, garbage, well, I'm garbage, up here. And... Yeah, yeah. But when you've got two guys on the same platform, if that TV company who pay, who, who pay their money, who pay them lots of money, can make that fight, there must put in having the fight that's on a tie, tied to any platform if you can't make that fight. They should literally just grab them both with a scruff of the neck and go fight each other or bug it off. You go, go, I wouldn't say that to either one. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> grab Gennady Golovkin. Listen here, G. But listen, you, you want your five, six million, ten million, whatever you get paid for the fight. Here's a fight. We got a fight for you here that we think is going to generate enough to, to 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 pay your wages. He could also move up in weight, big middleweight. Who? Demetrius Andrade. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> he could, he could do that. I think with Golovkin. I mean, I thought, no, no I don't. I, I think there's one fight that Gennady Golovkin moves up for, and I don't yeah. really see that being there, which we'll come on to. Um, but yeah, Dimitri Sandri move up to 168. He becomes mandatory again under the WBO rules, being a super champion or a super duper champion with the WBO, gets to move up and become mandatory, similar to Alexander Usyk, of course, and Anthony Joshua. Yeah. Maybe that's the way, Andy. Yeah, he's going to have to get creative, I think, and that that that's an option for him. Move up to to super middle and. We think we know what Canelo's going to do next, which would presumably involve vacating all of those super middleweight belts. And, you know, there'll be the, the land of opportunity. And as you say, he would get to fight for that straight away uh, due to the WBO rules. And it might just be the kind of change of scene that maybe he needs to 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 revitalise or just move his career on to the next, to the next level. Because I don't think... It's going to happen for him at middleweight in the way that he wants it to, and he maybe needs to kind of realise that mm. because he's done all he can do. He's he's winning his fights, he's calling everybody out, and it's not happening. And he's winning well, by the way. And he's winning well, so I think move up to super middleweight is probably the best thing for him. Actually, How, how's I, this I, one? I got to say, you don't when, when you're someone like Andre. Your title is just as important than your name. Yeah. So the problem is if he doesn't have that belt, yeah, you, then what has he got? Unless you're guaranteed a yeah, shot. Yeah. I mean, literally, I would. You only relinquish your belt when you walk into the ring for the, when you're on your ring mm. walk. And you go, yeah, I'm no longer WBO champion middleweight. You take that back, like literally, because you don't know where Golovkin. You might not. You might go to the cruiserweight, but not give up all the belts because mm. no, they're not going to say, well, yeah, all well, the government bodies. Uh, give uh, Canelo, Canelo, sorry, Canelo, you can't go. They're up, not going to make. They'll it. give oh, him all God. every opportunity. So, so you know, yeah. he might, he might do, he might do what. Uh, Santa Cruz did. You know, is he still featherweight champion? He haven't boxed featherweight for seven years. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't, haven't made nine stone Santa Cruz since he was thirteen. But you know, and, but and they might it might be that case with him. So you think you don't give up that title because then you're just an avoided fighter with nothing to offer. That's True. the worry. That I think unless you, I said the thing with W, they do guarantee you a shot at, at the weight above if you're a champion, the weight below. But unless it's the fight's made and happened, because what happens if, if he gets injured and then someone else fights? So then it's, it's too much there's, of a risk. There's always it's too much, too much of a risk. Yeah, there is. Here's one before we move on to for Demetrius Andrade. Demetrius Andrade, hear me out, versus Dimitri Bivol. Feel free to say no. They could do that. I mean, Bivol's going to fight Umar Salamov next. Yeah, yeah, that's just that's, been ordered. Yeah, it's just been announced. That's a good. That's a good fight. Yeah, it is. yeah. 
But um, both the zone. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, do you mean not the biggest like heavyweight? He's kind say? of difficult to work out. The ball, isn't he? Because yeah. one day he's good, one day he's shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly, exactly what it is, isn't it? Yeah. That's exactly. I it. thought he was going to be an absolute star when he was coming through. Yeah. Like when he was, we're just getting to like when he beat up Jean Pascal and like we'd just come through and he just like he looked looked brilliant. He looked like he still had improvements to make and he's kind of gone backwards, if anything, in recent times. I think Dimitri Bivol. He's a fighter with no gears. He's very good. I know yeah. sometimes those, those, I say those Soviet type fighters, they're, they're very clinical and good, but they fight at that pace and mm. that's it. But it's a good, it's good and effective. But sometimes, especially when they come in an American sort of style, they need to up the pace a little because, you know, and they just don't. And he's that sort of fighter. So they look fantastic. But then if you can, if you can like mess around with that, then they, they get exposed. Like but even when they win, they sometimes get exposed a little. Yeah. Bit. I quite like that fight. Android versus Bivol. I think it yeah, sol watch that. solves some issues, doesn't it? If you talk about it as well, like we're talking about Danny Jacobs moving up to box Joe Smith. I think Android is you know, just as big a middleweight. If not, I know Jacobs boxed at super middleweight and he was a big, big middleweight when he was there. But that's not, I think that's not, I think that kind of does a little bit for everybody. And we're not, apparently not going to see Bivol versus Batabiev because if mm -hmm. we would have seen it, we surely would have seen it by now. Because, again, you're not really protecting it. Neither of them are massive draws or yeah, massive ticket true. sellers. So, surely, if that fight was ever going to happen, we would have seen it. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of my left field. Both on the zone. Both it's can't mad, get the uh, opponents. Like, like, we're, 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 what are we doing now? We're picking names from different... Uh, and middleweight versus a light heavyweight. I just feel sorry for women's boxing because people go, yeah, you know... Um, yeah, Katie Taylor should box Clarissa Shields. Like, oh, hang on, they're like four different weights. Yeah, yeah it doesn't matter. There's some big stars, you know, and she moves down a weight, she moves up a weight, and we make the fight. And it and it was feasible talking, wasn't mm. it? Like but like you can't it's not, and I think that's not fair. It's because mm. there's a the lack of depth. They just they gotta just jump up weights and fight each other. Well, I think and that, but that's what we're doing with men now. <laughs> yeah. But that that's why I was so surprised. <laughs> you can't you got to the stage where you're pulling it, sorry, yeah. you're pulling names out of anywhere because and also while we're kind of on the subject, if Andre moves up to one six eight, who are the big fighters at one six eight? David Benavides, PBC. Mm. Canelo Alvarez kind of whoever but yeah. he's not going to get that fight uh, no. if, he'd, if he even comes back to 168 you've got Caleb Plant there 168 is not that deep you've got like David yeah. Morrell coming through and then you've got what, Anthony, Dur Anthony Durrell coming through like, and, uh, what uh, 36 yeah, yeah. Well, he's yeah. coming through he's on the surge <laughs> but like where does he get the fights at 168 so he might end up say moving up to 168 Canelo vacates the titles he boxes Walter Calton Dockwa again and then he wins a 168 title and then he's in exactly the same position for the next two or three years, calling people out and trying to get fights, yeah. cross promotion. He's not going to get. Then there's no one to call out. At that yeah, that, that's it. That, that's why that, that was what I meant when I, I said he, he. You know, it's not like he needs to be admitting career, defeat, but he just he, he just needs to maybe just box as much as he possibly can. Just keep boxing, boxing, yeah. boxing, boxing. Make the money. Box three or four times a year. All right. If none of you fellas are going to fight me, I'll just keep fighting my mandatory. Anyone who wants it you know, three, four times a year, just keep fighting and mm. make the money that way. It's not yeah. what he wants, but if you're it's a professional, really you've got to take what you can get. Yeah, of course you have. I know. Canelo Alvarez moving up to cruiserweight. Interesting. Andy? I was really surprised when I, when I heard that news. I know the, what's always great in these situations is, is people who may even have once suggested that they thought it might possibly happen one day, then come out afterwards and say, yes, well, you'll find that I, <laughs> yeah. that I, that I predicted this forthwith. Um, <laughs> and there were a few people around, pals of ours, some of them, who kind of did, so so well done to them for that. But I wasn't one of them because, and I never really wanted to see it because I don't want to see someone lose because they step too far up in weight mm. and I know it's not quite the same with the WBC because they're going to set their cruiser weight limit at 190 to the old division and they've got their uh, bridge weight division or the bridge water weight division as Joe Gallagher called it on, <laughs> on the pod with me and Macklin the other day um, but I don't ever w want to see someone lose just because they've stepped up too far I, I don't I'm not interested in that and and but having said that I think he probably would beat Makabu I think he probably would beat Makabu. Yeah, yeah, I think he would. I don't think Makabu's a kind of substandard world champion necessarily. I think he's but solid. Yeah. He's 
World yeah, champion. I think I think Canelo World probably champion. probably would beat him, but I don't think Canelo would beat Breedis, for example. I no, think that no. would just be he's just too be too strong, you know, all of that Carl Frotch type stuff. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I was really surprised. I was really surprised. And, and to be honest with you, I'm not really that interested in it. Really? No, not it really. Surprises me. I know that I know that it, it'll be a big deal because it'll be another weight division and daring to be great and all this kind of stuff but it's just I would rather see him fight Viterbiev yeah. or Charlo or, or one of those yeah. really yeah. Anyone, anyone who's like who's more skillful and active he's picked cause he, he hasn't gone up and picked the best cruiserweight he's gone up and picked the, it's, it's like I got no interest in it really I, I mean I'll watch it because mm. it's Canelo he's always good to watch but it's not it, again he, he's, he hasn't gone and picked the, the premium Cruiserweight, but he still picked a world champion, a big man. He's, he's a bit, guy no, can punch at the no, weight. No, no, no. It's, it's a massive risk, and you know, a crazy risk, really. Why would you want to? Why would you, why would you want to do that? Because you, like, you're taking away so many advantages you have. But I thought that of going up super lightweight was 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 the issue with that for him. But you no, know, it's a, it's a crazy move and ambitious. But you know, they have to pick the guy who's who's hittable, not not the yeah. fastest, can punch, of course, and is strong. But you no. Know, he, with with Canelo's judgment of distance and timing, flat footed as well, Macario. Yeah. You no, know, Canelo. Can, I think Canelo can can sort if he can knock him out, you know, box him like, and that that's the worry. And with someone like Braders, who would be very active for lots of punches, be busy, strong, solid with everything he got, not as easy to hit, with clean. That's a hard to fight or a goalie, you know, with, with, with the you know with the reach. And he's better than all these fighters, but. Macaulay's six foot five and a half. Mm. Exactly, he has a size fifteen shoe. With, with, that's it. With the, with, the, with the reach of a seven foot two fighter. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? It's just ridiculous. Isn't it? So you know, the old cost would be a big problem for yeah. him as well. You know, it's, it's rangy punch. One thing I do wonder about it is is whether if he moves up to cruiserweight, whatever it ends up being, if it's one ninety with a WBC or, or whatever it is. Will he then have to stay there? Will it make coming back down a la Roy Jones when he went up to heavy and then had problems nah. when he came back down to light heavy? But that can be a problem. Yeah, I was going to say, we don't know, we don't I, know until we see it, surely. I would, I would think he'll just go in at his, at his walking wrong weight. 180, 185, something yeah, like that. Yeah, which is a bit below, but he'll be fit and strong and, and, you know, and, whatever, and he'll be able to eat healthy. You know, and, and supplements and yeah. all that. Like that it, makes a yeah. lot more sense, doesn't it? Rather than trying to, because that can be a problem. I, I think Jones was what like, was he one nine six against Ruiz. Then he had to get back down to one seven five, yeah. beat Tarver the first time, which people generally kind of forget. Yeah, and then and then it kind of went wrong. But that was that was what I wondered. I just thought, but they'll have thought about all of this. Yeah, obviously. And it was just, <laughs> that might be a swan song. No, I think he carries no on chance. boxing. It's just whether does. or not he. I think he, he does, but you, know, you don't know what's in his mind, do you? And he's been boxing since he was like a kid, and he's made. Mm. I, th million. I think it's a really hard fight. I think it's a really big risk. Like, I have of to say, like, I, I, I think beforehand, your Benavidez is. We spoke about this before. I think Benavidez is a guaranteed action fight for Canelo, and one that I give him no chance of winning. I don't think he beats Canelo. I, I can't see oh. it happening. But as much as I think Benavidez is probably the better all-rounded fighter compared to Makabu, Makabu's still a fucking cruiserweight. He's still yeah. going to be a big guy. He yeah. can still well, hit. But let's, but let's put let's put Canelo in with Tyson Fury then. That's what it gets. No, you. Think but that's, you know, no, but that's that's, that's kind of what I'm saying. Yeah. But this is exactly the thing. That, so no, to get so uh, he beats everyone in his weight, like Canelo. He beats everyone. At, he beats everyone at super middleweight. So uh, everyone at middleweight. Everyone at super middleweight. They might be good fights though. Like, I'd like seeing Box Golovkin again more than Box Macabu. Even though I think he beats Golovkin, I still think it's a great fight. They'll never have, they'll never have a rubbish fight, them two. Mm. I just think, you know, I almost, it's almost a guarantee that, I could, that Canelo wins. So, what's the interest? I understand that. But, you know, these, like, they're like um, circus fights now. That's, yeah. that's what they're circus fights. Put him in with Joshua then. Put him in with Canelo. Put him in with Uzik. Make music. You, you, make music. You might see it happen. Like but Eddie Reynoso was saying, like obviously he trains out of the same gym as uh, Frank Sanchez, Andy Ruiz. Mm. He says what he can do with them in sparring and stuff. It wouldn't surprise me to see him go up and box a, I don't know, a Trevor Bryan or a Manuel Char or let's somebody just get like that. Let's just get the weight divisions then. That's the way it's looking. That's the point. This is the, like. Oh, we're not it, conforming. It's to, kind of we're not conforming reserved to, for super special fighters where you would see kind of a move like this. You would never really see it from kind of a run-of-the-mill fighter, of course, for obvious reasons. But I think this is a harder fight than Jamal Charlo, David Benavidez. Because the only I think Artur Baterbiev is the hardest fight for him, in my opinion. 
But then I kind of hadn't really factored it into the whole kind of Canelo conundrum, or like where Makabu would sit with that. But I think just the sheer size of him makes it the second most difficult fight, in my opinion. But I think, yeah, I agree. Kind of Golovkin, Benavidez, I think Charlo, I think the build-up would be more entertaining than the fight, personally. Um, but they're kind of more exciting fights that I guess we'd all kind of programmed and made our peace with in our head before this announcement came. But I really think the Makabu fight is going to be a difficult fight for him. Because what if he hits Makabu and nothing happens? We've seen Makabu hurt by big punchers. Tony Bellew could punch at the weight. Dmitry Kudryashov can knock a house down. He's not too good with what comes back with him at this stage of his career. And we've seen Makabu hurt by those guys. But, you know, Canelo didn't really hurt Callum Smith. Yeah, he kind of beat him up and won every round. Obviously, Caleb Plant, he hurt him and stopped him. But these are super middleweights, not cruiserweights. But they're better movers and better boxers. So even though mm. he's hitting them, they might be taking the sting out of the shots. I don't think the can't take the sting out of the shots. But he's huge. And I, I, he's huge. So it's, it's, a mad, it's a crazy risk. It's a crazy risk, a crazy fight. But if I was 19 or 15, I'd be going, wow. But now I'm an old man. So I think it's a thing. Like, people will watch this and go, what's he on about? Like, so this is a real, this is just a life changing, you know, he's just, he's changing the face of boxing by doing this crazy stuff. Well, Leonard did it and boxed for two, he boxed for two weights at the same time. You know, when he boxed Daniel Lomond, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's not, it's not new, it's, 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 it's bizarre, but I don't, for me, I don't, I, I'm not, a, again, Dandy, I'm not a huge fan of it, but I'll watch it mm. with with intrigue, of course I will. I think the closer the fight comes, you know, all the naysayers will be loving it. Can oh, no, I do. I, I want to see it. Yeah, I, I, I will watch it. I will watch it. But you're right. I mean, my, my question with, with Baturbiev boxing Canelo would be, at some point he's going to come up against someone who shrugs his shoulders when Canelo nails him clean and can stop him when he hits him mm. that will happen but mm. but when but when you go further up like like Barry said as opponents get bigger they also get more static compared to him that yeah. that's that's another thing we were talking about or rather I was the other week Julio La Cruz moving up from light heavy to heavy in the amateurs and my initial thought was not sure if that'll work out for him because he doesn't punch he's not really a puncher and if they catch him and then I just thought but the flip side is can see the shot they'll coming. be easier to hit mm. And he can and see the shots coming. He'll be even harder to hit for them. Mm, yeah. Um, so there's kinds of different factors, but by the time it comes around, I'll be I'll be all over it like a rash. I would but say, I would rather watch him uh, fight Baturbiev. I would say with Canelo, this modern Canelo, you know, from from just before Golovkin since, has been unhurtable. Yeah. If is that totally. a word? He has been. Like, I've never vulnerable. Known. Uh, yes. Oh, you should be. Who's you should, who's you should, to talk for? You should talk for a living. That's, that's yeah. why we've got him on Boxing Social this Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Him, not me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, he, um, but yes, and I think you no, know, that's the, all these other fighters. I'm, no one's been able to hurt him. Even Golovkin, for God's sake, couldn't hurt him. And that's when you just thought, oh, would you beat the guy you can hurt, who can box, who can move. He's not a dancer, but he got great free feet can punch hard, he's accurate and has good boxing skills, a great IQ. You know, is we, are we talking about Goloff? Are we talking about Canelo? Are we talking about Crawford? You know, it's you know, different styles but the same sort of yeah. things. But at that bigger weight, if Macabre can hit him and hurt him, who says he can? I think you know you tend to think he would, but tend to think the would. And all those that's the intrigue. That's but for me it's a bit of a circus fight going up there. And and again, but what's to stop him from boxing, you know, he's he, the guy's my height for God's sake. It's crazy when you think about it, isn't it? He's like he's not he's like he's maybe a half an inch taller than me. And we all know how short I am. <laughs> <laughs> but you could you could you could find a heavyweight in the top ten or fifteen that he could beat. That you'd be really that you'd be confident he could beat because his movement is good enough that they probably wouldn't be able to hit him over the twelve rounds and he'd hit them enough that he would you would have to give it to him on the cards. Would you pick Canelo to beat Joseph Parker? No, because I think Parker's Actually, a pretty good mover, I think. I don't think he could beat him, but um, Canelo. This is going to be a new game on boxing. Yeah, I know. We, 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 oh, 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 oh. Canelo Chisora. Canelo yes, Chisora. That's exactly yeah. what I was just going to say. Yeah. I think he could, yeah. But he wouldn't be a bit. Because he's too crude, Chisora. That swings what I mean. over the top. He'd be rolling, and slip, that's, and he dips. That's what I mean. You know, someone who's. They would find it very, very it's difficult to, hit him. to even think about. Like, I'm trying to process it now in my head. Like, what that would look like? <laughs> I don't, or I don't, throwing don't, tables at Canelo. And I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> see. I don't want to see Canelo versus Makubu 
All of a sudden, I'm like, ooh, Chisora. <laughs> <Ooh." laughs> you know, this is the rabbit hole you go down, isn't it? Because you you think to yourself, okay, well, his 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 pluses, his strong points against someone like Makabu is, you know, will Makabu be able to hit him clean? Maybe not. And then if you take it up a weight, it's going to be even more difficult for a bigger guy to who's less mobile yeah. to to hit him clean. If they do do it, then surely that would be it. Because how could he how could he take that? But hitting him clean is a really hard thing to do. And also, if he can still carry a bit of power with speed, by, mm. by the way, because they just cause they just think someone like Jazar would just think I'll just run at him. Cause little fellas run at him because when the big the, when they're bigger they are, however good you are. You're like he intimidates people with his presence now, doesn't he? Mm. Like he still does this. A, a super middle, but I thought that would be a stretch for him moving up, but he still does it. He won't have that uh, at a cruiserweight still. You, know, you won't be able to put Macabre with the pressure just by putting his front foot in his centre of his stance. That won't work. Mm. He's just not physically big, big enough. Though he does sort of grow about four inches in height when he gets in the ring, mm. doesn't he? We, in a weird we, we, yeah. He's small in he Canelo. He, he all of a sudden, he gets a bit wide and a bit tall, and he looks just a bigger presence all of a sudden when he's in the ring. It's a, weird, it's a weird thing, isn't it? It's amazing, like, actually, how, how that works, but I just don't see it against the bigger guys. But he has enough ability to box him, and I think enough power and pop and speed and great timing to catch him clean and often to make them stop running at him. Because that's what they have to do, we just run all over him. No, that's when Makuba has got fast feet. He hasn't got fast hands. You know, he can be hurt uh, like against bigger guys, but yeah, but not him against uh, Lucas Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Allen still fighting, you know, mate. Dave Allen versus Dave Canelo. Allen. Canelo. Yeah, at the Don. Imagine at the Doncaster Dome. Yeah, the Magna Century Rotherham. <laughs> <Yeah, yeah. laughs> Steffi Ball could put it on. Steffi <laughs> Ball, yeah, that'd be great. Well, I don't Imagine. know how we've got onto this, but anyway, moving moving on. Um, Canelo versus Derek Chisora, Cinco de Mayo, twenty twenty two. Moving on, Tifimo Lopez versus George Cambosos. Yeah. Finally, we finally got it. What a saga! <laughs> yeah, what a saga, and it's kind of in its own way, it's helped the fight really because you know what was kind of a run of the mill mandatory has now got this whole long story that's gone with it with Triller and Matchroom and Top yeah. Rank and all sorts of stuff, and all of a sudden people are actually looking forward to the fight, Andy. Yes, and. I'm glad for both of them, Cambosis particularly, that it is actually happening because I, I know that when when Triller steamed in with that massive purse bid, about six mil, wasn't it? I think double what double what Eddie bid. Um, Eddie's bid was still huge, but that theirs was absolutely incredible. It's the kind of thing you look at it and you just feel really pleased for the fighters involved mm. because you just think this is hugely life-changing money. And then it doesn't happen. But then the next best bid is still really, really good. So they're both going to make a lot of money out of it. I think they also got a percentage of the defaulted bid they as did. well. Yeah. They did. Yeah. They did. They did. I I don't see... I like Cambosis when he came over to London and boxed and boxed Lee Selby. I bought his confidence right from the beginning. And, and we were talking about this last week where during a fight week, you, you get a sense of whether someone is really confident or not because you'll see them in unguarded moments and their team. And if you spend enough time around kind of stalking people, which is which is what I like to do, you you figure it out. You figure it out as to whether the confidence is real or not. And and it definitely was. And he showed it on the night. And it was a really good win. But but Lee Selby, with the greatest of respect to him, um, at that stage of his career, certainly is not Teofimo Lopez. And Cambosis will, he will be confident. He will believe in himself. He will be courageous. But he can't beat him. I think, um, and if you'll agree with me, Barry, those kind of characteristics that we've seen from George Cambosos, obviously against Lee Selby and earlier in his career, it's going to kind of work against him, in my opinion, in this fight. I think yeah. the fact that he does have that mentality, that we've seen them kind of separated on stage and stuff. Cambosos is naturally a fiery guy. I think that's going to work to his disadvantage in this one. I just think the fact that you, know, you said all the things I was waiting for you to say, but he's hittable. Mm. That's the problem. With, you know, if, if, if Lopez can hit you, Competitive, you uh, know, repetitively, you got no chance. That's the truth of it. I feel more sorry for Lopez than I do Cambosos with the delay because coming off that massive win, Lomachenko, so no, so, so just a, a win of like it's one of the best wins in, in recent times. It's phenomenal. You know, beating Lomachenko, just you no know, being competitive with Lomachenko is good enough, but beating him, something special. 
and then nothing. Tumbleweed. Yeah. Nothing. You know, the, the momentum on our win should have carried you onto superstardom, and it's just been nothing. It's unfortunate. I wouldn't go as far to say as I feel sorry for him, purely because I think in the immediate aftermath of that, we saw come, you know, we saw some stuff in the media between him and Top Rank, you know, where he very much went off the reservation and, and kind of shopped around and I'm now the A side, I'm the Floyd Mayweather, we're gonna do two million buys. Obviously went to Triller, kind of nailed his flag momentarily to the Triller master, um, and quickly kind of realized that that was oh, a sinking ship. And has ended up back with, well, not even back with top rank. I mean, Uncle Bob has kind of has, has allowed this one to play out quite nicely, whereby Matram are now bidding or paying for, as you said, Andy, a good amount of money for a, a, a mandatory yeah. fight that doesn't have certainly the appeal of two million pay-per-view buys, which is what was initially well, put Well, I, well I, think, I think, yeah. <laughs> two million pay-per-view yeah. fights. We, we, uh, that was it. That uh, Tifumo Lopez Sr. kind of going back to father-son uh, yeah. relationships. That's a really interesting one between those guys. He's the new Angel Garcia, isn't he? I think, well, that, <laughs> They yes. fell out. Like, go, going back, like, they fell out before the uh, Nakatani fight. Uh, yes. Tifimo Lopez Sr. Yeah. and Junior yeah, fell out. Yeah. And it was, again, it was, it was Tifimo and him and his, his wife. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was something to do with... I don't want to go too far into it because it's a, a personal situation. But, you know, the, the, it's always, and they're both pretty volatile guys, as I understand it as well. Joey Gamash is now no longer part of the training team. By all accounts, he was instrumental in the Lomachenko fight. Um, it's obviously done really well with some other fighters yeah. as well. He's coached recently, Otto Wallen being one of them. But yeah, I think um, the writing was on the wall when it was, I think at the time it was the same weekend or one of the rearranged dates was Mayweather, Logan, Paul. And Tifima Lopez Sr. come up and said, oh, well, you know, we're Floyd's going to move the date because he knows that we're going to do this and we're going to uh, sell that. Uh -huh. And like as good as the win over Lomachenko is, it's one win. You're 22, 23 years of age and stuff. You still have quite a long it's way to go. That. So. It's that it, well, no one understands. It. We're, all we're, all, we're immersed in boxing and that's a great win. And it's a stand-up win. But unless you transcend the sport, yeah. you're not really a pay-per-view star. That's the truth. Mm. You, know, you, you might do pay-per-view, but unless you transcend the sport, you're not really a pay-per-view star. You're just a good boxer who's earning good money. And so, like, I think, Bob, I'm not sure exactly, So, but I think Bob Adam bid like two million. Yeah. I think he said, I overbid. Yeah, yeah. Because I just want to guarantee I get it, but it wasn't worth that. Oh, the bids I didn't mind insane. taking the hit. Yeah. The bids were insane. Ryan, and, then Eddie did. and then and he was and he was pissed off with Eddie, wasn't he? Because Eddie yeah. overbid. It's like you know, the, just... there there had been an agreement. And again, this this story like there's more of this. <laughs> this if the fight would have just happened, it would have well, it would have been over by now, and obviously everyone would stop talking about it. But like, there's this whole story to it now that's out of the ring. Like Eddie and um and Aram at the time were negotiating Joshua Fury. There was there was some documents linked of kind of internal emails and stuff between top rank. I think it was Todd DeBerth and somebody from the zone whereby it was like, okay, don't oh, bid on yeah, this fight, yeah, please. I about that. Yeah. So there was all sorts of, of kind of shenanigans going on behind the scenes. And Eddie bidding for the fight, and, and obviously not, at the time he didn't win it, but now it's been defaulted to him, yeah. didn't go down too well with top rank. I think there was a gentleman's agreement whereby Matchroom wouldn't <laughs> bid on the fight and obviously Eddie went and uh, did his own thing so yeah it's there's so much story there's so much politics involved in this oh. fight this is what I hate remember though. when it was going to Australia <laughs> that was yeah. that random moment that it's been, never, that it's been in New York honest. it's been on Triller but Barry's 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 so right with what he says about there are a handful of genuine pay-per-view stars yeah. in boxing. A handful. Everybody else, pay-per-view is is what you're chasing because that's where that's where the money is. And as soon as anybody gets a real big win, then they talk about I want to be a crossover pay-per-view star. Great, great to have ambition. But the reality is that Canelo's won, Anthony Joshua's won here. That's probably it. That's probably it. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. So you beat Lomachenko, who himself massive name in boxing, but not a crossover star. You wouldn't, you wouldn't say. And boxing is not as big a sport as we think. No, that's no, it. When you're in the inside, bubble, when you're, we, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I totally understand when you when you score a massive win like that, you you think to yourself, okay, this is what should happen for me now. And it coincided as well with everybody talking about you know, the new four kings yeah. or six kings or 17 kings or whatever it was we were going to have at lightweight. And of course, none of that has happened. i got to say about this, this four kings this stuff, like I was around, they were called the Fabulous Four. I can't remember them being called the Four Kings. It's George Kimball's book, isn't it? Yeah, it's, we've got it here somewhere. Oh, there it is. There oh, it is. When, when, was that when was that written? I don't It's quite recent, I think. There you go then. 
It's a recent thing. Thank you. Because I always thought they were called, because it was a video, a cassette called The Fabulous Four. And that's what I thought yeah, they were called. Really nice. and explain it, what that yeah. is to some people watching this. I think Barry Watt can say this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, at the, I'm at an age where it used to be Betamax before oh. it was VHS. But um, anyway, who gives a shit about that? <laughs> <But> it, <laughs> I was going to say, but Peter Max actually was a better was a better product, but not not um, marketed as, as well as VHS. I'm not an expert in these things, but just move on, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> but VHS wouldn't have beat Lomachenko. I'm telling you that, that's guaranteed. But I th I think for me, I, I I don't see Gabosis as a chance. I think he'd be competitive and he'll go at him. But again, as, as we all agree, I think there's just plays into into Tiafimo's hands, and I think it'll be. Uh, I think you do well to see six rounds. Yeah, I I think. What about the weight? You mentioned the weight to me the other week. Yeah, so I don't. I, my kind of, I mean, I have a few zany calls, and not all of them come in. But mine has been really since the fight was announced. I don't think he makes the weight. I wouldn't be shocked. See if he Lopez, and I think he blows it by a couple of pounds. I don't. I I, I think it kind of gets to a point, and as people will know, kind of the closer to the fight comes, the more difficult it is to make the weight. And he's still growing. And if you've seen him in real life, and you've met him in real life. He's just a ball of muscle. Yeah, he's a big guy. In between camp and stuff, you see fighters who put on a bit of weight and stuff like that. Yeah, he puts on a bit of weight, but there's no fat on him. And I think he stayed down at lightweight for the Lomachenko fight and the Lomachenko fight only. Well, they they pretty much admitted that. Yeah, they? and that's over a year ago. Yeah. So I think it gets to a point in the fight week, if it's not already got there, because obviously you would have been tracking your weight in the last few weeks of camp in particular, where it gets to the point where it's either... A, unhealthy and, so and unsafe. Trying. Or B, he just goes, no, oh, fuck that. And, I, and just vac he vacates the titles, doesn't pay the sanction and fees, and he moves up to 140 anyway. That's been the talk for him for a long time. After the Nakatani performance, which was a bad performance, he spoke about problems in the camp and there was the personal issues, but he also spoke about the weight, made the weight for the Lomachenko fight. But again, when it's your moment and it's the biggest fight that you've ever had in your life, you can do it that one time. You're looking at George Cambosos and mandatory, and you're thinking, how much do I have to pay to not make the weight? And also, you think, okay, when it's, see, you can sometimes he's like, going to come in at like one, three, four and a half now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you, can make, you can make weight, and in, and in another fight you can make weight, and it's and it's, you think, well, I've changed this as hard, but it's how you make the weight, mm. or you or you taper down, and sometimes you leave it to the last minute. But when it's like a big fight, like a Lomachenko, you don't you leave no stone stone unturned, do everything right. So that's why you make the weight. Mm. However hard it is, and other times you think, oh, I'll leave it to the last minute. I've seen fighters like, no, like Carl Zaghi do it wrong. It will talk, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. So confident, you just make it the weight's the hardest thing. So I'll just leave as long as I possibly can before I really cut the weight hard mm. and then have a little bit of a panic. So yeah, I just think that, yeah. Either, but either way, if he doesn't make the weight, and he's, he should, there should be a bigger fine for not making weight. Mm. I do think, particularly if you blow it. I mean, there's the, the no. The, I don't. The, the, no, I don't think if 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 it's if it's an ounce. Yeah, but there would be, there's a sort of difference between somebody missing weight by an ounce or two and somebody who yeah, the, the the reference point I always come to in the example is Adrian Broner blowing a weight by three pounds and weighing him drinking a can of Fanta on the scales. That, <laughs> that's different than missing it by an ounce or two when you're clearly drawn and you've been trying to make the weight. But obviously, I do understand what it's you're not, saying. It's because yeah. it's not fair, you know. Like uh, like it, it's happened to me. I'm afraid that he's never made the weight when he and, and got got away with it somehow. But like that's not the reason why I lost. No it. decision. Go back. Uh, sorry, they, they should, Scratch it from the record. But if, what I mean, it's like, it's, 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 he never cheated. It's just the way it goes. But it's, it's some people cheat. By the way, he was like that, by the way. No, he really tries. But like, some people don't even try. You see, yeah. they, they are, like, again, Rona, I don't care. I'm not going to make the weight. I'm going to try and make it. And he might do the same because mm. he thinks he's a huge star. And what's Cambos going to do? Not fight me? He needs the money. Mm. No, and it's big money for them. Yeah, they'll work out some sort of like again. This is this is based on nothing apart from the fact that I've actually I've I've met Tiffany Lopez that, over. Though. Yeah, no, I back it, but like over a couple of years, two or three years, really. And the first time I met him, I was like, "Whoa, shit! This guy makes lightweight." And that's like two, three years ago. Yeah. He's at the stage of his career where he's still growing. He's had the inactivity. I can see him missing the weight and I can see him kind of, because he's already got one foot at 140, despite him talking about wanting to fight Josh Taylor at 138 or whatever that he's been talking about. And I think he then moves up to 140 pounds. I don't think he boxes. If he makes the weight, I think this is his last fight at lightweight anyway. And I think he moves up. I hope so. I mean, I don't want, I want him to make the weight, but I also want him to box Josh Taylor. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. It's a good yeah. fight, isn't it? It's a good and they really don't like each other. Josh Got Taylor does not like people talking shit about him. <laughs> but Andy spoke, Andy uh, Purwell, not Clark, uh, Boxing Social's Andy Purwell, not Boxing Social's Andy Clark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he actually went into the gym, uh, the top ranked gym with Josh Taylor the other day and, he's, and Josh Taylor 
sort of has that switch. And some fighters can conceal it quite well. Josh is not one of those types of fighters. And as soon as the Tiafimo Lopez name got mentioned, you sort of see this complete change in his face. And Josh is, is the Scotsman. The Scotsmen are afraid of, isn't he? He's, he's certainly, as much as he says he's not interested in the fight, you put them two in a room together, and I think you've that. There's your pay per view fight because I think they'd yeah. sell the fight as well. I think they would, yeah. That's that's a really big, well. high level fight, but I think that that has the the, the potential at least to. I cross like over. the fact that Josh won't recognise Lopez as an undisputed champion, mm -hmm. even though we all know that he is yeah. really. We all know it. It's it's just, it, yeah. It's when you start getting into the technicalities and the bullshit and the politics yeah. behind things, isn't it? Um, but Lopez, I think as well, he's quite. Uh, he. Um, I saw him in Vegas, Fury Wilder week. He sat down and did did about twenty minutes with us, and and yeah, physically, you're absolutely right. He's got this kind of not peace and love thing going on, but he's quite zen and quite kind of like thoughtful and and all that kind of thing. And I'm not saying that Josh isn't thoughtful, <laughs> but at the same time, Josh is just kind of like he ain't zen. He's not zen. <laughs> he's not zen. Not he is zen. not zen about boxing. He's got that incredible ability to stay totally laser focused and ice cold in the ring. He's got all of that. He's got all of that, but I think he looks at someone like Lopez. I genuinely think he looks at him and just thinks, you're full of shit. And I'm going to show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, think there's a great I'd class love to personality see that fight. there. I think Taylor is better when he's angry. Definitely. Yeah, when he has that's why the, 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 the most of the fight comes. Because he still keeps that, like you said, he's yeah, still, yeah. still focused. It's a cold But he needs, a, yeah. he needs that burning fire inside him. To yeah. And he him does like, it himself. Like, obviously, I couldn't make it out to the, the Ramirez fight. But you see, like, I've been around Josh in some of his biggest fights. And the closer it comes. And he kind of, you know, like, everyone watched The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. Where he kind of picks yeah. something yeah, yeah, that yeah, somebody yeah. says and go, And it would just allow it to kind of consume him. Or, like, you make up these yeah. own little personal that's battles it. in your head. That's Josh it. Taylor's like that. Yeah, like, totally. When and, look at and, Progray, like Progray, yeah, yeah. Progray and Lopez are kind of similar. Or for Josh, they would be, I think, because Progray's got a great story. And he came over to the UK with a month to go. Uh, uh, Mel Takemoglu got him yeah. doing loads of press. Yeah, loads and of people really kind of bought into him. And I think Josh Taylor's sitting there just thinking, fuck your story. Yeah. This is a fight. <laughs> this is a fight. We've all got a story, mate. You know, you can. Yeah. You know, like that, yeah. isn't he? And it is. I love it. I, I go absolutely say, I go love say. it. It's true though, we all got a story. Even they even focus on stories now. Like I did a big story on React Pod, you've this great story. But it's like, that's not that's it's not new, is it? That's it, like most, most yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, yeah. Most, that's almost every boxing story. So I'm right? just trying yeah. I'm just trying to find the name of the opponent and I wasn't there. So Ryan Elliott, who of course works at Boxing Social, formerly of uh, Cyclone. So he's responsible, as we all know, the press officer of writing the, the press releases and giving information out to the media. So Josh Taylor was boxing. I'm not sure. I think it might have been his fourth fight against Lee Shaibi. Shaibi? Lias Shaibi. Lias yeah, Shaibi. Yeah, Fred Southpaw. I think so he did that one. It might have been him. It might not have been him. I might have been confused. Uh, but it was a late replacement or late-ish replacement last couple of weeks. So Ryan, of course, in his job as press officer, was sending out a press release to the, the, uh, the media and he couldn't get any quotes. So what you often do, what you often do, we'll kind of put some quotes together, attribute it to the mm -hmm. fighter or speak to the manager. Is he okay with this? Yeah, no problem. Let's put it out. So he'd put in there, I don't know, Chaibi says, Josh Taylor is overrated. He won't see four rounds, blah, blah, blah. That sort of thing. Um, sends it out. Says to Josh, look, Josh, we've got the opponent over. We've told him this and blah, blah, blah. And we've seen so Josh Taylor knows that this is made up. And this has come from the press officer. First thing he does at the press conference is they get together, they do a face-off. Josh Taylor sticks the nut on him and says, you've been talking, have you? And he knows that it's completely made up. That's the type of kind of sadistic it. mindset you're dealing with here. But kind of touching on the Ramirez fight, we had um, Andy Perowal out there and he interviewed Josh and, and he sort of said to Josh about it. And again, it was that fight week. He was like, well, there's no UK, there's no UK TV, and you could just see it revving him up. Yeah. And he was saying, well, "It should be fucking Taylor versus Ramirez, not Ramirez Taylor. I'm the number one." And those things, he does, he gets on and he fixates he on them, and it gets gets him going and going and going. But because more often than not, you say felt, to a I fighter, felt the same though, to be honest. Yeah, no, I agree. But a lot of time, a lot of the time, you'll say to a fighter, or fighters will get that, and you think, "Well, you know, focus on what you're doing." But with him, it, it all kind of works together. It's all he keeps it so yeah. controlled and so focused, and he allows that rage, which is what it is. I like it to I just fuel him. I love, I love it. it. I love it when you see fighters switch during fight week because Wilder's taking it a bit far at times. Mm. But but with some of the things he said, but I like it when you see fighters switch during fight week when it's and real. get. Yeah, and get meaner and meaner every day. I remember that uh, Super Series final with him and Prog Gray fight week. I was doing the Sky podcast and I got the two of them together 
which I thought, mm, don't know about this, but we'll try it. And I said, Josh, is that okay? And he said, he, he said yes, um, in a way that didn't fill me totally full of confidence. <laughs> but, but I, I, I was I was fairly confident he wasn't going to try and chin Regis Progre four days out from the fight. But I've got them either side, and and like one of my microphones wouldn't really work, so Regis had his own microphone and Josh didn't, and it fucking irritated him <laughs> and you could see that it didn't and and then I asked a very basic question which you have to in that kind of format where I said so what's gonna you know what's so Regis what's gonna happen on the night and he said oh, I'm gonna knock out Josh Taylor and then Josh is there just simmering basically saying well and, and then said so what's you know what do you think is gonna happen and he said well what do you think I'm gonna say he's gonna say he's gonna knock me out. I'm gonna say I'm gonna knock him out he basically just said to me well you're wasting my time mate what <laughs> yeah. is this bullshit <laughs> Um, but I kind of I I I, I loved it. Like, yeah, it just because for him at that, at that for that week or month or whatever it is it, for him, this it's not a box. It's you're you're in my way. Yeah, so that's, you, and that's how yeah, he you looked. said something to me. Like yeah. you said you, you whatever it is, you find your own. I mean, I used to run, run pub, you know, I had a little space of being an asshole and like and I would have arguments with people and to, to get me riled would me be thinking. <laughs> If I want the midget, I just call myself a midget. Like in time, <laughs> they wouldn't say that to me if I was six foot three. I, that would build me up. They were a bully, and that would get me angry yeah. enough to go, "Oi, get out!" Or whatever. You know, like, yeah. they, no, it was, oh, oh, my, me be an asshole. But that's what he does. Mm. He picks like he focuses on something which is totally irrelevant yeah. or not, or didn't really happen or whatever, yeah. and just go. You yeah. can see you can see the fight week for the Ramirez fight where. Ramirez, who by all accounts is a lovely man, very mild mannered, nice mm. fella, and you could see him the first time they faced off, looking at Taylor because Taylor was really giving it to him and getting his face going, "Oh fucking, what's yeah. this?" Like, and again, <laughs> again, Ramirez is a guy with a, with a great backstory. Yeah, you know, he's he's looking to help the community that he that he was raised mm. in with with problems with with irrigation and food and all these kinds of things. And I genuinely think that Josh hears all that stuff and just thinks. What is this? Yeah, is this uh, is this is this this is your life or is this a fight? What's yeah. going on? I think he yeah he really you know, does have that that edge to him. But him against Lopez and you could and I could definitely see like, Lopez saying some things that would get under Josh's skin and it would just add to it because you've mm. got two confident, unbeaten kind of alpha male types. I know Tiafimo Lopez is Zen one minute, but other times I've heard him say some pretty oh, heinous yeah, stuff, yeah, particularly about George Cambosos in the build-up to this <laughs> fight. So they're two young studs. Josh, yeah. obviously not as young uh, as Tiafimo Lopez, but two stud fighters really going against each other. That's the fight that I would love to see at 140. Be a great fight. I know Taylor wants the Crawford fight, but um, but Crawford has now come out and said that he doesn't see that happening anytime soon. So. Yeah, but, he's, but so T Taylor's saying the same thing about Lopez, really, isn't he? Mm, I, yeah. listen, I don't know what he's talking about for. Like, who the fuck is he? Mm. Nah, you, 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 you're going to go where the money is, aren't you? And that's, and I, I just think with Josh, it was unfortunate that he that he won his his fight against Ramirez during COVID, and there was toing and froing with with UK TV, and that wasn't ideal at all. But everything wrong with boxing now. That, that yeah, I really, I really want to see him, you know, just become the star that he deserves to be mm, because yeah. he's he has got a great personality. He is he is really interesting. Um he's amazing to watch. I just really want to see that happen. He's for the so, sport, but you know, yeah. I don't really know him particularly, but for the sport, I really want to see that happen because we've got someone who is that good and has got everything you want. Everything you want. And I know People criticise Joshua for never really saying anything and always up the real Anthony. And, and I get why when you've got the sponsors he's got, it's very difficult to say what you really might think about something and, and all of that kind of thing. But with Taylor, you've got someone who is, you know, that is, you don't have to dig very deep to find out who he is. No, absolutely And not. it's real. And, yeah. and it's See, real. I'm not, I'm not a fan of all, all this build-up for fights now, overselling stuff. When it's, when it's all put on, throwing tables and all that crap... I don't buy. It. I just think, oh, well, I'm like, I don't interest in this because it's, it's not real. Yeah, it's not. You're out, you might you might lose your temper a bit, but that's not real. You've done that for show. Sure. You've planned that in your head. He's just generally reacting to how he feels. Yeah. So I don't mind that. I like. The, no, I don't. I, I don't like all the aggressiveness, but I don't mind that. He's my favorite fighter, Josh Taylor, by the way. So yeah. Well, not, what not, do we expect? You know, this is this. It's the most personal thing you can possibly do. Go and fight another person in the ring. That's. Let's not make any any mistake about that. And he will always find something. You you'll never find him in a fight where 
it'll be, oh, well, you know, there's not gonna really going to be any, this is two gentlemen squaring off and we'll shake hands afterwards. That's never going to happen with him. He'll mm-hmm. he'll find something to hate you for in the build-up mm-hmm. to that fight. It, it was the, even Baronchik fight where he became world champion, he was pissed off that Baronchik was nicknamed the Beast. You remember him saying to me? <laughs> he, he, he was saying to me in the fight week, he's like, calling him the Beast. I'm the Beast. And I was like, all right, Josh, just get yeah. me alive, please. Perfect. I, I just like to say, right, that we, we were talking about Cambosis and Lopez, and you went off on a tangent. I never... Yeah, well, it, it does happen from time to just time. Just want to say, I to try and squeeze I, the words in when you can. When you I get the blame, I get the blame, but this time it was all you. All right, before we before we round off uh, today's episode, uh, random one to end on. Well, we've spoken about Josh Taylor, Tiafimo Lopez, and Terence Crawford. What would you rather see next for Josh Taylor, Tiafimo Lopez or Terence Crawford? Lopez. Yeah, me too. Why? I think Lopez you know, needs to go up to 140. I think Josh can still do 140. Mm. I don't think he would need to go up to 147. So it'd be more of a level playing field in in that regard. And, and I just think his personalities, they are, although Crawford and Taylor, in that Crawford's, cold hard. Hard. Crawford's like Taylor. He might mm. not look like he loses no, his shit he doesn't, quite he, as much as he's Josh. Not vo- he's not vocal. He's not as vocal, but mean, yeah. in his head during fight week, yeah. he will be he will be the same I, as I can as genuinely Taylor. see Taylor and Crawford going out the back and having it. Yeah. yeah. That that would be the type of thing. That, that I yeah. think that's the type of press conference that could just go out of nowhere. Whereas I think Lopez and Taylor would be quite, would build and build or they'd have their moments. Whereas I think Taylor Crawford would just be nice and quiet and then someone would say something and it would it go would be fine, straight away. Yeah. I mean, literally, all the shouting and arguing, I mean, literally, you could whisper each other and go, if you really, if you really want it, let's go at the back then and go, all right, then let's go then. Yeah, and, 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 and they would both off. say yes yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> and I haven't felt, and the last time I felt like that was Liam Williams, Liam Smith. Mm. Yeah. And then I, I thought them two would generally yeah. go, come on, let's go at the back then. They would have gone out there and had it. Like, yeah. I remember. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of a show. And you think, like oh, you say, when, when, you, when you're around a fight where it's real, of course you don't want that to happen because it will put the fight in jeopardy, but, but that's that's the real juice. That's what yeah, we really, yeah. really that's love what about the essence it. of the sport. Is. Yeah, let's not no, be let's yeah, be honest. Absolutely, there's no yeah. point trying to pretend that this isn't Blue Peter. Yeah, you know, it's not the Great British Bake Off. This mm. is this is boxing. <laughs> mm. uh, but but you know, there seems to be an enthusiasm. Everybody's looking for different audiences and all the rest of it. Uh, uh, everybody seems to want to try and repackage boxing as as being every now and again anyway for being kind of like cuddly fun for all the mm. family, accessible mm. to all. It is accessible to all because you don't really need any kit and you could go down to the to the local gym and get stuck in. You know, I'm coaching kids at Newham on Tuesdays and Thursdays and they're coming flocking from from everywhere because it's cheap. They take subs, but half the yeah. time they don't. Yeah, that's mm. right. You know, so it is accessible to all, but it just is what it is in terms of um, what happens and um, it always it always will be and that for me is its selling point yeah for sure and the higher it's almost as if like the higher up the food chain you go nowadays the more that people try and because you start getting these big events I always liken Wilder Fury 1 to Wilder uh, like and I compare Wilder Fury 1 to Wilder Fury 2 where I felt like Wilder Fury 2 the build up was a lot more corporate because you had Fox you had ESPN it was yeah, very much yeah. kind of like big corporate you know massive commercial fight whereas the first one was kind of like the Wild West where you had like Queensbury and it was like sort of showtime but it was a Tom Brown show and it was all very <laughs> kind of all over the place and you had Shane Fury running up on stage with his crutches at the press conference <laughs> and all sorts of guys. Yeah. and like you, you kind of when, when a fight gets to a certain level of, 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 of kind of commercial appeal you want to keep as you mentioned those sponsors on board you don't want to say anything too bad but ultimately we watch it for the the, the strife and the 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 yeah, the vitriol between them. You do want to see them shake hands at the end, ideally. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Know, you do want that. You want That's the, what you want. You want to see the respect. Yeah, you don't see. I don't care because sometimes you don't have to be best. You friend. don't like no. somebody. Like I think Josh Taylor might not like you forever. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. That's one of those. Like you're, you're my yeah. enemy. That's it. No, I got no issue with you. I don't have a problem with you. But we're not friends. Yeah, we're not fucking friends, mate. Mm. Don't come near me. Mm. But 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 he has a respect after that if he, has, he's not like, he doesn't like program it's still not does he no. but you can, it doesn't look that way but I think I've respect for him because he had a really hard fight with him but like you know that's how it works you don't you want to see just real that's, yeah. that's all I want to I see didn't, I didn't mind it like after Fury, Fury Wilder when Wilder said what he said it was I didn't mind that mm. I, he doesn't like him mm. you know and he probably never will 
Yeah. And it would have been better for boxing if, if I guess, if they'd embraced and, and, and the, a little word in each other's ear or whatever. But I'm, but I'm totally fine well, with the You've got to own who you it. are. Josh yeah. Taylor owns who he is. That's what I would say. So he owns who he is. He wants to be liked by everybody. I understand that. But I mean, he owns, he, this is who I am and this is what I do. And that's sort of, I can't change myself. I think, you know, and that's, and if, if, if Wilder can own who he is, reacting the way he did after the defeat, fair enough. Yeah. You know, if you can't, then then, then you know, that's your problem. You've got to live, live with that. But, like, you know, if you are what you are, and you just accept it. And so I behave accordingly. And, and and I think Josh Taylor just does that. And that's why I love him, because he just know this is who I am. I'm fighting you. Good luck. Don't ever touch me again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, that's all we've got time for on episode 31 of the Boxing Social podcast. Uh, just like to thank, as always, Barry Jones and Boxing Social's Andy Clark for popping along today. Before I let you go, you may have seen the huge announcement across social media that Boxing Social will be broadcasting Wasserman and Boxing's development series this Thursday, 6.30 p.m., live on Facebook and YouTube with myself, Mr. Andy Clark, and not Barry Jones. Thanks very much for stopping by, and we'll see you soon. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.